absolutely love how this song just is a perfect description of the gospel. And there's a rendition of Romans 10, 10 in the version of the Message Bible. And I just wanna read it out for a little bit. And it says, it's the word of faith that welcomes God to go to work and set things right for us. This is the core of our preaching. Say the welcoming word to God, Jesus is my master, embracing body and soul, God's work of doing in us what he did in raising Jesus from the dead. That's it. You're not doing anything. You're simply calling out to God, trusting him to do it for you. That's salvation. With your whole being, you embrace God setting things right. And then you say it right out loud. God has set everything right between me and him. And I absolutely how this, love how this worship song just highlights the truth of the gospel is that God came to redeem us. We didn't have to redeem ourselves. That wasn't what he chose to do when he came to bring Jesus to the world. When he allowed Jesus to be a perfect sacrifice, he did that redemption process for us. And it's such a sweet reminder to know in this morning, in this day and age, that your works don't need to have a place for you to feel like you need to do that in order to get to heaven. Jesus loves you. And I just wanna remind you that of this morning, wherever you are, however you're hearing this, I just wanna remind you that before you were even born, before you were even existing in this generation and these years, God already sent his son for you. God already sent his son to die and give you forgiveness of your sins, to give you a purpose, to give you a new hope. He already did that. And it's not by our works, it's not by what we can or can't accomplish, but it's rather just accepting the love that Jesus has for us. And it's an unconditional love. There's no need to, to have to work. There's no need, there, there isn't a, um, 
way of, of being fooled out of this love. It, it's just pure and it's unconditional for you. And I love how this worship song just highlights that, that God went to fight your battles before you even knew it. God went to rescue your heart before you were even aware of it. And all he asks is that you praise and that you worship and that you bow down and that you surrender it all and that you say the words, Jesus is my master. Jesus just wants to have a relationship with you without the need of you having to work to earn his love. He already has given it to you. So I just wanted to remind you of that this morning, wherever you are, wherever you find yourself, that God loves you and he has a plan and a purpose for your life. So Jesus, we just thank you for this moment of worship, of praising worship, where we can declare with our own mouths, God, that all we have to do is surrender, that all we have to do is praise, that all we have to do is worship you and you do the work in us. You fight the battles, Father God. You take that stress and that anxiety away from us so we can worship you. And as the Bible also says, cast your anxieties on him. And we do that this morning. We do that this morning. We cast our anxieties at the cross, at, at Jesus's feet. And we declare that we will receive love, that we will worship, that we will praise you without thinking that there is an extra cost included. You have already paid it all, Jesus. And we thank you that we can declare that and remember that of this morning, wherever we are. So we thank you for this moment of worship. Would you continue just to move in our hearts, to move in our surroundings, to move in our being, and let us receive that love in your name we pray. Amen. Hi, I'm Christy. And I'm Isaac. And we're the Muscles. We have two daughters, Brooklyn and Holland. We have been at Eastside for about 10 and a half years now, and I have lived in the U.S. for about the same amount of time. This is my hometown, Perth. This is the Swan River, and you can see the city in the background. Um, most Australian cities are centered around a body of water, and we spend a lot of time in the water. I moved to Brisbane on the East Coast for several years um, to work for a creation ministry called Creation Ministries International, and they are one of the reasons that I ended up moving here to the US. About 11 years ago, they uh, started the process of sending us over here to kickstart our US office. We were just planning to come here for a few years, um, maybe three or six years, but then on my fifth day in the country, I met Isaac and we're now here forever. Life is very busy. Um, it's got lots of ballet and no sports at all. <laughs> um, we've been attending Eastside um, for about ten and a half years, it was the first church that we actually attended together. We've made lifelong friends here. It's just been a very special part of our lives and the girls have all kinds of friends and people that they care for greatly. Isaac works in healthcare, I teach dance and homeschool. Um, but life is busy and we can't imagine it anywhere else right now. Hey, my name is Marlon Guevara, and I'm from Honduras, and she's my wife. I'm Melissa Guevara, and I am from right here in Marietta, Georgia. So when I was 21 years old, I finally moved to the States um, since my parents moved to this country when I was eight years old. And so I grew up with my grandma and my two brothers, um, you know, having that dream of one day we will move to the States to be reunited with my parents. All that period of time, um, I grew up thinking that it will it will be almost impossible for um, because in my country in Honduras it's really hard to get a visa and, and get approved to move to this country. You grew up thinking that this is a great country where you have the freedom of speech, freedom of religion, which it was very important for me. So finally came the day, uh, and then I, I reunited with my with my parents, and um, after a few years of being here, maybe two years, I start finally move. Uh, working and um, playing in churches. And then God uh, gave me the opportunity to, to, to play in this, uh, at this church, and inside Baptist. And then uh, I got a, a contract as a musician just to come and play on Sundays. Um, and then in that process, God spoke to my heart and, and said that this will be the church where, where I will call, I will call home. Um, and then here in this church, uh, I met my beautiful wife, uh, which has been the most amazing blessing to my life. And here we have two beautiful kids. Um, I have a, an amazing family and amazing friends in this church. And it has been a dream. 
So what, what once a dream now is a reality. And it's amazing the, the things that you can do um, if, you're, uh, if you trust the Lord and, and of course the opportunities of this amazing country. Hey there, my name is Adrian Kutzer and I get to be the campus pastor at the Eastside Mosaic Campus on Ostel Road in South Cobb County. Uh, our family has been a part of the Eastside family now for two and a half years and this is my wife. My name is Jennifer Kutzer and in addition to us being here at Eastside for two and a half years, uh, my grandparents were some of the founding members of Eastside many years ago. So I am originally from South Africa. My hometown is Pretoria, which is the capital of South Africa. I am the son of missionaries. So I was very young when we left South Africa and we went to the Comoros. The Comoros is a small group of islands in the Indian Ocean. And we spent about four years there when my dad planted and grew a church. Then we moved to Madagascar. We left Madagascar as a family when I was about 16 to go back to South Africa. We spent a few years in South Africa and when I was almost done with high school, we left Africa altogether and we moved to France. Once in France, I finished high school, I went to college, I went to grad school, and while I was in grad school, I was helping with some of the mission work in the area, and one group I knew, some friends of mine, needed some help with a translator, and so I agreed to just go spend a couple weeks with them to do some translation with this group of uh, short-term missionaries that had come to Paris. And that is where I met Jennifer. We got married in the fall of 2007 and in the spring of 2012 I became a citizen of the United States. And what's really neat is while well, I'm from South Africa, I'm African, my wife is from right here. We now have three children, we have three boys and our youngest boy has been adopted and he is from Asia, he's from the Philippines. So we really have a very multicultural uh, international family right here in the backyard of Eastside Baptist Church. We have a lot of diversity in our family. We are very different. We have different personalities. We have different backgrounds. We have all journeyed very different journeys as you can just see looking at the faces here. But I think that's the beauty of being a church is in spite of our differences we come together. Hello, uh, my name is Jamie Guthrie. And I am Alessandra Guthrie. And we have been a member at Eastside for almost 20 years. I was born and raised in Guatemala City. Um, my country is called uh, the country of the eternal spring because the weather is similar to the spring here in Georgia. One of the reasons why uh, I came to the United States is because I married JB. Um, but the way that our paths cross is, is, is just that we attribute it to God. I am grateful that I am able to worship in a free country. I am thankful that I am able to teach my children uh, about God. And I am grateful that um, they will have many opportunities that I didn't have in Guatemala. We're raising four kids in a multicultural home. Uh, and that's, that's hard. There are challenges with that, trying to help them live in the world of being um, an American, but also identify as a Guatemalan. Uh, but one of the things that we are thankful for is that the kids have embraced it. Uh, and it gives them opportunities at school and in the community uh, to dip into different cultural groups and to feel comfortable about that. When we talk to them um, heart to heart, um, they're thankful to be from a multicultural household, to speak more than one language, uh, because they see um, that's what makes this country such a great place. No matter where we are from, we call this home. No matter where we are from, we still call this home. Because no matter where we are from, we call this home. No matter where we are from, we still call this home.
led by reigning Cup Series champion Kyle Busch in green, and their crews, the entire garage area, has rallied around Bubba Wallace and the number 43 today. Because yesterday afternoon, a noose was found hanging in the garage stall of Bubba's race car. In the NASCAR Cup garage area, a secure area where access is limited to competitors, officials, and track staff. A despicable act by someone flying directly in the face of NASCAR's efforts to build a culture that is diverse, equal, and welcome. That's why Richard Petty is here today and why Ryan Blaney, Bubba's friends, competitors, and on-track foes have closed ranks around him. When that window net goes up later today, racing is the great equalizer. Everybody's six foot four, 240 pounds. Everybody has 600 horsepower. No one is white, black, brown, or yellow. They are all racers, and they are all our heroes. It is a strange, difficult, and yet a holy time to be preaching on this weekend in which we're celebrating the independence and the origins of our nation and our nation's history. I was thinking as I was preparing for this message that two years ago I preached a sermon on what it means to be a unified people in the midst of an increasingly polarized society. And it seems funny to think back on the fact that that was two years ago. How many of us wouldn't love to get back to the relative security, stability, and even community that we felt like we had two years ago that certainly all dissipated now? The level of polarization that we are seeing in our society has simply reached pandemic proportions. People have drawn up rigid and certain sides against other people who have drawn up rigid and certain sides against other people who have drawn up rigid and certain sides. It can be dizzying. It can be disorienting. The news media, of course, who is supposed to be presenting dispassionate facts to educate the public, they are instead riling us up emotionally, and you can find the right news network to, to, to match your own political and cultural persuasion to make you more emotional than ever about how right you are and about your side. The politics of division is, of course, the rule of the day because it works. It's the rule in the White House. It's the rule in both chambers of Congress. It's the rule in both political parties, divide and conquer. That's how you get votes. And, of course, all of this polarization is amplified by the dehumanizing plague that is social media, causing people to take up their rigid sides and plant their feet more than ever. And I must personally admit, I have often been more a part of the problem than I have been of the solution. Yes, America is more polarized than ever before, but that doesn't mean God isn't up to something. See, in order to get to the resurrection, we first have to go through the darkness of Calvary, the darkness of the cross. In order for God to do a new thing, sometimes he has to help us deconstruct the old things and the old mechanisms. In order for God to heal us, we must recognize that we're sick. And I think you'd agree with me. Right now, in 2020, America is terribly broken. And then there are moments like this one. Moments like the one that you saw on the video just a moment ago that cut straight to the heart. You may have heard the story, Bubba Wallace is the only black driver in the highest echelon of NASCAR racing. And in response to injustice, in response to threats, what you saw were hundreds of drivers and pit workers that walked behind his car the day of the big race to demonstrate their love for him, their support, and their solidarity. And when I saw it the first time, it moved me to tears. Obviously, it moved Bubba Wallace to tears and the other drivers. <laughs> they're all wearing their masks. They're not supposed to be hugging each other, and they can't help it. And if you were there, I bet you couldn't have helped it either. So let me ask you a question. When you survey the crowd, 
that's on that NASCAR track, do you think that each one of those individuals who is there in support and solidarity for Bubba Wallace, do you think that they vote for the same political party? Do, do you think that each of those members in that crowd, do you think that they have the same views on police funding or police protest or police tactics? Of course not. And that's not the point. Because in that moment, see, their disagreement was subservient to something greater. In that moment, their disagreement didn't matter because in that moment, they saw one another. They saw into one another's shared humanity. Jesus said to Simon the Pharisee in Luke chapter 7, 44, Simon, do you see this woman? The power of a moment can allow us to see something that we never saw before, to see through our disagreement and have compassion and empathy. Be careful. Your life could be changed by the power of that kind of moment. Yes, we're polarized in our country, of course. And I would imagine that polarization has even touched our congregation in certain ways. But the polarization doesn't have to have the last word. We can be changed by a different kind of moment. Not a moment of polarity, but a moment of mercy. So open your Bibles, if you would, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and Matthew chapter 5. And I'd like to deliver a message under just that title, Moments of Mercy. I'm going to read the entire chapter here of 1 Corinthians chapter 8, 13 verses. And what we are reading about here is a polarized congregation in an ancient Greek city called Corinth. And they're polarized around a very specific issue. And I want you to pay attention to what this leader, Paul the Apostle, says. Maybe even more so, I want you to pay attention to what he doesn't say. Scripture says this. Paul's writing, he says, Now about food or about meat that has been sacrificed to idols. That's the subject. The whole chapter is going to be about that, eating meat sacrificed to idols. We know that we all possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. The man who thinks he knows something does not yet know as he ought to know. But the man who loves God is known by God. So Paul says, first and foremost, love is, uh, should be elevated above knowledge or being right. Facts. There you go. Verse 4. So then, about eating food sacrificed to idols or eating meat sacrificed to idols, we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, he's speaking of the, the, the culture of ancient Corinth in which there are gods and lords and temples and idols all over the place. Yet for us, verse 6, there is but one God the Father from whom all things came and from whom we live, and there is but one Lord Jesus Christ through whom all things came and through whom we live. But not everyone knows this. Paul says not everybody in the church agrees with what I think, along with some of you Corinthians, on this matter. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat such food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to an idol, and since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. But food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat and no better if we do. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your freedom does not become a stumbling block to the weak. So one group here is called the weak in the church, and another group elsewhere is called the strong. So two sides. Verse 10, for if anyone with a weak conscience sees you who have this knowledge eating in an idol's temple, won't he be emboldened to eat what has been sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against your brothers in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. And here's the crux of the matter, verse 13. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause him to fall. And our second verse is simply from Jesus' magisterial Sermon on the Mount and the transcendent beatitude that precedes that sermon. In Matthew 5, verse 7, Jesus says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. I want to invite you on a journey with me for just a few moments back into time, 2,000 years, to this ancient, bustling, booming city of Corinth, a colonized city in northern Greece. I want you to go with me now there to the Agora, the marketplace, the center of town. And what you're going to notice when we hit the streets of this town is that 
it is really, really loud, really, really bustling, really, really crowded, really, really intense, and really, really tense because ancient Corinth is really, really polarized. I want you to consider the history of ancient Corinth in this light. You see, we're not so far after the great conquest of Alexander the Great, who had broadened the Greek empire from sea to sea, bringing great pride to the Greek people and expanding Greek language and Greek culture across the known world at that time. This was Corinth's heritage. But after a while, the Roman Empire came to power and they conquered all of this territory that Alexander the Great had conquered and then some, including the city of Corinth. And so you see this clash of cultures, this polarization everywhere you go in the very physical landscape of ancient Corinth at the time that this church is planted and at the time that Paul writes this letter of 1 Corinthians. Because alongside the great, proud, traditional Greek architecture of the older buildings, guess what? You see the newer buildings that are in the style of Roman, not Greek architecture. Alongside the great Greek temples to the Greek gods of Aphrodite and Zeus and Persephone and Hermes and Apollos and the other, well, you see the newer Roman temples to the new Roman gods. And this offended the traditional Greeks. Alongside the great Greek statues to the Greek warriors and Greek philosophers of old, there are now new statues to the very Caesars that conquered the city, killed their ancestors, and enslaved the rest. And if that weren't enough to create a a hotbed of tension and polarization, guess what? Historians suggest that perhaps near half of the population of ancient Corinth were enslaved persons. And that polarization, unsurprisingly, had made its way into the church. That's what the chapter we just read is all about. You see, two factions had drawn up in the church with their rigid, hard lines. One called themselves the strong, and undoubtedly, they probably gave the name the weak to the other side. By the way, we see these same factions in Paul's letter to the Romans, showing that it was a major crisis among uh, Gentile Christians in the early church. And each side thinks they're right, and each side thinks that the other side is depraved and wrong. And the issue that they're fighting over seems really weird to us, but it was a really big deal to them. The issue that they were at war over within the church was whether or not they should eat meat. Now, all you vegetarians out there, there's no reason for you to get pompous and think that this is a win for your side. It wasn't really the meat itself, per se, that was the problem. It was the way the meat was processed in a Roman city like Corinth. You see, there were no, I guess the term is secular slaughterhouses in that day. Instead, in any formal or informal meat processing, that animal would be ritually dedicated to a god before that animal became food to be either sold in the marketplace or dined on publicly in a temple or in the town square or in any format like that. Now, for the strong, this wasn't a problem because they reasoned, rightly, I think, that these gods didn't exist. It's just stone and wood. It's sticks and rocks. There's no magic incantation that's related to someone dedicating this to a dead rock. So we can eat all the meat we want. It's really no big deal. But the weak, they saw it differently, you see. They had come out of paganism. And they felt like to eat meat that had been sacrificed to a god was to compromise their allegiance to Jesus Christ. So the strong looked at the weak and said, oh, you're so silly, and you're so uneducated, and you're so unsophisticated, and you're so superstitious. How could you even think this even matters? We could eat meat because none of these gods mean anything. They don't exist. And the weak look at the strong, and they say, you're just a bunch of sellouts. You've got an opportunity to stand up for our Lord Jesus Christ who stood up for us, who died for us, and you can't even do that. You can't even give up your hot dogs and sausage in order to stand up for Jesus. Now, I want you to watch what Paul does. And especially I want you to watch what Paul doesn't do. Paul could have taken so many easy ways out of this situation. Paul could have found so many ways to not tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. But he doesn't do that. Think about it. Paul could have come in and said, you know what, this whole meat eating thing is really not that important. You just need to drop it. It shouldn't cause division. Just drop it. Just stop stop talking about it. Forget it. Paul could have come in 
and said, you know what, you shouldn't even be aware of this. We should all be meat blind. If everybody was meat blind, this problem would just go away. He, he doesn't do that at all. Paul could have, have come into this context and said, you know what, Corinthians, you just need to agree to disagree on this. Everybody keep their opinion to themselves and this will just go away. I find it terribly meaningful and inspiring that Paul doesn't do that. Instead, Paul tells precisely the truth. He does not mince, he doesn't hedge. He tells them exactly what he thinks. And here's what's wild. What Paul thinks is that the strong are right. Paul says unequivocally, hey, strong and weak, I know you both feel super passionate about both sides. I want you to know, I think the strong are right and I'm a part of that group. This is remarkable. Paul says, I agree, the gods are nothing. These, these, little, I, I, these little idols are sticks and rocks. It doesn't matter. We, we, and on all you guys with green eggs on 4th of July weekend, you're with Paul, aren't you? You're excited about this. Paul says, eat all the meat you want. It's fine. It's no big deal. But Paul ends not with compromise. Paul ends not with, I'm right and you ought to follow me. Paul ends with mercy. He says in the last verse, if what I eat causes my brother to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again. I would rather never eat meat than cause offense to my brothers and sisters in Christ, Paul says. Paul says, above all, I'm going to preserve and fight for moments of mercy. And I've got news for you. Moments of mercy, they can change our lives. So how do we create moments of mercy just as Paul did? I wanna give you three simple steps. Here's the first one. The first one is we listen. We learn to listen. We learn to actively listen. We learn to work on the muscle of listening. We learn that listening is not easy. We learn that listening takes effort. We learn to do the holy work of listening to someone else, especially someone who disagrees with us and who we disagree with. I just finished a book, second book by an author uh, I, I like. He's actually a movie maker, not so much an author, but he's wrote a couple of books. His name is Brian Grazier, and he's known for making movies like Apollo 13 and Friday Night Lights and A Beautiful Mind and American Gangster and on and on and on his catalog goes of these uh, remarkable movies. But he didn't start out famous. And he didn't start out rich, <laughs> and he didn't start out well-known or well-connected. He started out as a courier on movie sets. That's the bottom of the barrel. That's the guy who makes the coffee for the you know, people putting the costumes on the actors. This is, this is low, low, low level. He's delivering documents to people, but he's determined that simply being on the movie sets is gonna give him a connection somewhere where he can launch into the industry, and he does just that. He partnered up with another really famous movie guy named Ron Howard. You probably heard that name, and decades ago, they started a company called Imagine Entertainment, and everybody laughed at him, and now here they are, world famous and rich. He tells a story that goes back to 1980, and he says, this moment set the trajectory for my success. He and Ron Howard were meeting with a group of writers. They were up against deadlines. Pressure was on them, and they walked out of the meeting that they, he, Grazier felt like it had been productive, and Ron Howard looked at him and said, Brian, I need to tell you something. He said, have you ever noticed that you hardly ever look people in the eye when they talk? And Grazier was offended. He said, I, I got all the information that I needed out of that meeting. Sure, I was responding to some emails and multitasking, but that's life, that's, that's business, that's especially our business. I, I heard what I, what I needed to say. And Howard said, well, you might want to think about it. And Grazier did think about it, and he decided that he would be fully present for people from then on. And he writes in the book, he says, I attribute all of my success to the fact that when I was just starting out in the movie business, I learned to slow down, look people in the eye, and listen. Do you know how to do that? It, it doesn't come naturally. It certainly doesn't come naturally to me. You who are in the strong faction, do you know how to listen to the weak without judgment, without needing to, judge, to jump in, without thinking of your next response? Do you know how to do that? You in the weak group, do you know how to listen to the strong without judgment, without using that time to just formulate your next response? You who are Republican, do you know how to listen to someone who votes 
in a way that is different from yours without judgment, without formulating, you know, your next response. You who are a Democrat, do you know how to listen to someone who votes Republican without judgment and without formulating your next response and spending all of your energy in your own head rather than just listening? James, the brother of our Lord Jesus Christ, said in James 1 verse 19, everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak. Be careful. If we start listening to people, we just might be rocked and shaken up by a moment of mercy. Here's the second step to creating moments of mercy. It's this. It's to acknowledge and and in many ways to embrace my own bias, to know my own bias intimately so that I can study it, so that I can be aware of it, and so I can scrap it if it needs scrapping. Forty years ago, there was a psychologist at Stanford University. Um, Last name was Ross. Lee Ross, that was his name. (laughs) And he was interested in studying what made relationships go bad, what made relationships fall apart, what made relationships on work teams grow sour, and what made marriages that were once loving grow hostile and full of enmity, and what made friendships fall apart. And he did tons of lab work and research, and he developed one of several key answers And it was a specific phrase that he coined called the the FAE, the fundamental attribution error. And this theory of the fundamental attribution error, it it works like this. If you do something that bugs me, that bothers me, that frustrates me, I tend to fundamentally attribute that to your identity. That suddenly in my mind, my subconscious mind, becomes who you are. So you got the project in a day late because you're lazy, because you just have no initiative. You have no drive. It's who you are. And you, you snapped at me because you're a jerk. And you didn't give me my fair share because you're selfish and self-centered. But the other side of the coin is when I do the exact same thing to you, it's not because of my identity or some sort of intrinsic brokenness. It's because of my environment. Well, I was a day late on the project because I had a cold earlier in the week and I was laid up in bed with a fever. And I'm sorry, I snapped at you because my boss has been putting all this pressure on me lately. And I just feel like I'm in a pressure cooker at work. And I I spoke out of turn and I didn't give you the right credit because my head was just elsewhere because my kids been having trouble in school and I'm having a hard time focusing. And see, the, the, the first step to recognizing our own bias is understanding that, that we tend to let ourselves off the hook and it's simply a window into the fact that our own biases shape and in many ways misshape not just the way we see the world, that's less important than the way we see other people. One of the most beautiful things about the ministry of Jesus is the way that he just loved to root out entrenched bias. I mean, he loved to just needle and dig and pull that bias out of people and put it on the table to essentially say, look how nasty this is. You know, there's another way to live. You could live full of the love and grace of God rather than this nasty bias that you have inherited from your ancestors. (laughs) And we could point to example after example. I want to point to Matthew chapter 21, just because it's not a passage that most people visit very often. And in this passage, Jesus, it's in his last week and he's in the temple in Jerusalem. And again, we, you know, we, We don't paint the picture and imagine what this would be like. The temple at Jerusalem, the holiest, most important place for Jesus' people, the place where God dwelled. It took 46 years to build the temple at Jerusalem. Uh, Historians at that time, people were living at that time, said you've never seen a beautiful building until you've seen Herod's temple in Jerusalem. It was gleaming. It was a city unto itself. I actually got to visit the archaeological dig there a couple years ago. It's 20 east side campuses. It's absolutely massive. And there Jesus is. And guess who he is debating? At the very temple, the chief priests of the temple. Jesus is speaking to the most important people in the world, in the most important place in the world, for all of Jewish history. And this is what Jesus says in in Matthew chapter 21, verse 31. He says to these high and holy and important men, the tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. (laughs) Jesus says, you are so biased. You think you know who's in and who's out. You think you're an insider and you can point out the outsiders. Let me tell you something. God's flipped the script 
I'm about here to turn the tables in this temple to show you that God has flipped the script. And if you could just understand that God does not share your bias, you might have a moment of mercy that could transform your life. Here's the third step. And I think the most important step that we can take in experiencing transformative moments of mercy, it's this. Can we see the image of God in our opponent? Can we see the image of God in people that we disagree with? The most prolific martyr, Christian martyr of the 20th century is a name that you might be familiar with, a German theologian and scholar named Dietrich Bonhoeffer. In his 20s, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a worldwide phenomenon. He was in demand all over the world. He traveled the United States, Europe. The greatest and most prestigious universities were begging him to come. Just lecture, let us give you a job, whatever you want. We just want you in our community. He was that big of a deal. He was also living during a time and working during a time of the rise of Adolf Hitler and his Third Reich in Germany. And after Adolf Hitler was very clear, he was solidifying power in Germany. Almost all of Bonhoeffer's colleagues did one of two things. They either fled to the United States or Sweden, uh, like Karl Barth, or they capitulated to the Nazi ideology. They went along with the German state church, which went along with Hitler. And Bonhoeffer considered, of course, option A, not option B. He prayed about it, and he later wrote that the gospel requires us to enter the danger, not to run away from it. And so he stayed in Germany uh, and started an underground network of churches and actually started an underground seminary and was secretly training pastors in, in this way. You can, you can read the curriculum for his pastors in a small little book called Life Together. It's absolutely beautiful. Eventually, Bonhoeffer was involved in an assassination plot on Adolf Hitler's life, and he was arrested. He was put in prison for many years where he was still allowed to write, and he wrote prolifically. Then he was sent to a concentration camp, and shortly before the Allies freed that region of German control, he was hanged. He was executed. But before his execution, he wrote these words, and I must tell you, they have haunted me ever since I have read them. He said this, nothing that we despise in the other man is entirely absent from ourselves. I want to speak to you personally. Um... This is me. This is not me projecting what you ought to think or who you ought to be. I, I just think it's important that I be honest, if that's cool. Um, I have no problem at all experiencing compassion and empathy and hurt for people who have been the victims of injustice and brutality, inequality, and inequity. I, I have no problem with it. I, I believe in systemic racism with all of my heart and all of my brain. I believe that's data, I, I do. Uh, I have tremendous and natural empathy for those who continue to be victimized by the long legacy of Jim Crow and all the horrors that came before it. I, I, I have no problem announcing that black lives matter. I, I agree with Coach K of, the, of the, the Duke Blue Devils. This is not a political statement. Um, I stand with my black brothers and sisters in that regard, unabashed, no problem. That's just me. But the call of the gospel is harder than that for people like me. And the call of the gospel is harder than that if you're really, really angry at the fact that I just said what I said. It's harder than just being angry for you. The call of the gospel is to swallow hard and recognize that I am also required to see the image of God in the eyes of the person who espouses white supremacist ideology. Because as Bonhoeffer said, if I despise it, it's in me somewhere. Now, that doesn't mean we tolerate, doesn't mean we fail to speak out. Jesus spoke out against injustice. He was a prophet in the line of Old Testament prophets who also spoke out firmly against injustice at great cost to themselves and their well-being. That's not the point. That has to happen. Civil rights is a part of our Christian heritage, by the way. That's our thing. We started that. That's who we are. Um, and yet, I'm called to listen 
to sides that I find abhorrent, sides that I find anti-intellectual, sides that I find offensive, I must be able to look into their eyes and see the broken image of God because that same image of God is broken in me. And that image isn't any more or less broken in me than it is in them. We are all guilty at the foot of the cross and we Christians believe that the sin nature has impacted everything about us, including our perception. C.S. Lewis famously wrote, you have never met a mere mortal. <laughs> you, n- there are no ordinary persons. You have never met a mere mortal. Can I look into the eyes of the person I disagree with and see an immortal, see someone glorious, see someone who Christ loves and Christ died for? I'm gonna close with a story of a man that I, I, I bet you've never heard of. Um, and his name, let me pick it up right here, is, is Daryl Davis. I'm sorry, I've I literally, I, I heard about this guy from a friend years ago who just briefly said, I went to a retreat and the speaker was Daryl Davis and he spoke for 10 minutes and I, my life will never be the same. I have never experienced anything like this. God has completely wrecked me. So, and, and I kind of thought, oh, well, that's, that's cool and shelved it and never really looked into it. And this week I looked into the life of Daryl Davis and and it is absolutely jaw-dropping. I, I want to tell you about it and encourage you to check, check him out online. There's lots of news stories and things like that. Um, Daryl Davis was, is a black man. He grew up in a small town way, way outside of Boston, not, not a part of uh, the metro area, in which he was one of two black kids in the whole town. And he was, in, he was a Cub Scout, eight, nine years old, and you know, as they still do, his Cub Scout troop was participating in the town's July 4th parade. And people in the town began to throw trash at him, began to throw bottles at, at him. And he, the Cub Scout troop had to literally come around him and shield him from, from all this trash that they were throwing. It was horrible, this little kid. And Daryl Davis said, um, a question began to form in my mind that burned inside of me every day. And and the question is this, how could somebody hate me who has never met me? He said, you know, that was such a simple question, the question of a child. But he said, that question drove my teenage years, my young adulthood. He started to read everything he could about racial inequality, white supremacy, injustice, et cetera, et cetera. But he said, even the books couldn't satisfy the question that he, that he understood the data and the history and the research, but he was looking for a more visceral answer to this visceral question that went beyond intellectual head knowledge. How could somebody who's never met me hate me? So he came up with an idea. You are not going to believe this. What if I'd go straight to the source and just ask? So he had his secretary make a phone call to the, whoever the national leader for the KKK is, if it's the Grand Wizard or Grand Dragon, I don't know the terminology, but the number one guy, okay? And his name was uh, Roger Kelly. And, and Daryl Davis said to his secretary, it's really important that you don't tell him I'm black because otherwise we're not gonna get this meeting. So they set up the meeting and Roger Kelly agrees and says, yes, I'll do it. So they book a hotel room and... Um, Daryl Davis is in the hotel room with his secretary and the knock comes on the door and in comes the bodyguard of Roger Kelly and, and he's armored up, he's got a gun and, and there in the doorway, their eyes meet and there is that moment of shock when Michael Kelly realizes that Daryl Davis is black. But he comes in, they sit down, they talk. It's fairly tense for an hour, but each side talks, each side listens and Daryl Davis says to Michael Kelly, I really want you to come over to my house for a few weeks. Would you do that? And Kelly says, yes. So Kelly goes to his house. They spend time together. Kelly goes back to his house a few weeks later, goes back to his house. They start having meals together. Kelly invites Davis to his house, and they're hanging out at his house. Kelly invites Davis to the KKK rally, and Daryl Davis says yes and sits in the front row and starts to travel with Michael Kelly, going to dozens and dozens and dozens of KKK rallies. (laughs) Well, CNN, in its early days, picks up on the story. 
and runs the story, goes to the KKK rally and films this whole scene. Daryl Davis is on the front row and they interview him and he says, I sit on the front row, I listen to each Klansman speak, sometimes I take notes, I agree with some of what they say, most of what they say I disagree with, but I listen to them. <laughs> He's just there. And then Michael Kelly takes the podium and is speaking to this large KKK audience and at the end of his speech, he points to Daryl Davis and he says, I want you to know that this is my friend, and we don't agree about a lot of things, but at least he respects me enough to listen to me. I want you to hear the rest of the story in Daryl Davis's own words. Check this out. Sitting down and talking, not necessarily agreeing, but respecting each other to air their points of view. Because of that respect and my willingness to listen and his willingness to listen to me, he ended up leaving the Klan, and there's his robe right there. I am a musician, not a psychologist or sociologist. If I can do that, anybody in here can do that. Take the time to sit down and talk with your adversaries. You will learn something and they will learn something from you. When two enemies are talking, they're not fighting, they're talking. It's when the talking ceases that the ground becomes fertile for violence. So keep the conversation going. Thank you all very much. And here's what's wild, okay? That delivery of a KKK robe to Daryl Davis didn't happen just once. 200 Klansmen have turned over their robes to Daryl Davis and said, you have caused me to want to leave this hateful movement. Why? Because of the power of moments of mercy. And I tell you what, y'all, that just seems like Christianity to me right now. It just seems like that's what we're here to do to cut through the noise with the power of mercy. Let's pray. Lord, in a context that seems to be spinning out of control, where we feel so little control, help us grasp and see opportunities to do what we can do. Help us be mercy creators. Engage us, give us the gifts of moments of mercy. In Jesus' name, amen.